ready to go. So greetings on this Sabbath day in the middle of the day's unleavened bread this year here in OMAC. Today is the seventeenth uh, day of Nissan and the thirtieth uh, day of March, two thousand thirteen. And it is the second day of the Omer count. Day number two, which I plan to talk about today, because it is very important, and yet most people are totally oblivious and ignorant of it. And, and there are those few who are like the wicked son of the poor sons of Passover. The wicked son is a skeptic and a scoffer and denies everything in the Word of God and says, no, why do we have to wear uh, fringes in our garments? Why do we have to have garments anyway of fringes on their four corners? That's ridiculous. And you know Korah's Rebellion in the book of Numbers and Numbers chapter 16 was basically partly about the wearing of fringes because the Korah was of the tribe of Levi and he and his family and followers, they wore the blue of the fringes, the uh, tekelet blue in all their garments. So there you might say they were, their garments were blue. And yet God said in Numbers chapter 15, you shall wear fringes in your garments and they shall have the blue fringe amongst them. And it's all detailed there in that chapter. So Moses passed the law of God on to the children of Israel and then they all basically said, all right, we'll do it. Except Korah and his family and their followers. And they rebelled because they said, why do we need to wear blue in our fringes? Our whole garments are blue. <laughs> they thought, we're, we're, in other words, we're already righteous. We don't need a reminder of God. We've got the reminder of God in our, all of our clothing, the blue blue which represents heaven which represents God's throne well you read that chapter yourself you see they rebelled against Moses he and Abiram and, and said who do you who are you or who do you think you are lifting yourself up, up, up above the rest of the people all the people of the Lord are holy Moses Aaron now Korah was jealous because he wanted the priesthood he thought he should have Aaron's position. And Abiram, he wanted to rule the political authority in Israel, so he wanted Moses' position. And God showed them that they were rebellious because you read the chapter, the earth opened up and swallowed up Korah and his followers. And the others were burned up with divine fire and destroyed. And then God showed later after that a miracle that he himself had chosen the tribe of Aaron and his descendants to be the high priests. How did he do that? He had Aaron take his rod and the leader of every tribe of the twelve tribes brought their rods to the tabernacle and set them there. And then the next day they came out and looked at the rods and Aaron's rod was budded with almonds and all just bring, bringing forth fruit. All the rest were just sticks, you know, just pieces of lumber standing up on like a staff with no change. <clears throat> so God showed by his divine power that he chose the tribe of uh, Levi and the house of Aaron to be the high priests. So rebellion, God showed the, to the Israelites, he said to them, when they were coming out of Egypt, he said on the day that he gave them the Sabbath day, and showed them, reminded them what day was the weekly Sabbath, in Exodus chapter 16. <clears throat> and he says he gave them manna for six days, and on the sixth day he doubled the portion of manna, so they could just go out in the desert there and gather up this manna, bring it home, and bake it, boil it, broil it, and eat it, and it was angel's food. And it, it, 
lasted for 40 years. God provided miracle, miraculous manna for them. The word manna literally in Hebrew means what's it? They were eating what's it bread, you might say, for 40 years ago. They'd never seen it before. They'd, what's this? What's it? And that's what they called it. And uh, so for six days, God gave them manna supernaturally. And he said, don't go out on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day, that's the Sabbath. It's holy. You shall rest on that day, and there won't be any manna. Well, some went out anyway, thinking they'd gather more, and there wasn't any. But that they gathered on the sixth day lasted for two days. So then God said to Israel, he said to Moses and Israel, how long is it? Why don't you keep my commandments? In uh, Exodus there, chapter 16, it says, how long? Verse 28, and the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place, that no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So we're not to be traveling around all over hither and yon and doing our own work and our own business or on the Sabbath day, but to basically stay put. Doesn't mean you can't take a little travel today and an automobile if you don't go for a picnic in the park or, or something but uh, this was talking about ancient Israel that they were not to labor and work or go traveling on the Sabbath day they were to stay put and the, these rabbis interpret that to mean if you're in a village you should stay in the village you could walk around the village or go to a park in the village but you weren't to go out of the village to another town or don't take a trip or travel. And if you did leave the village or the town, you could only go what they called the Sabbath day's journey, which was like from Jerusalem and the temple up to the Mount of Olives, which was a Sabbath day's journey and back. So God says, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments? That's a good question we should ask ourselves today. In Psalm 25, David writes the attitude we ought to have about God's word and God's commandments. Psalm 25, a psalm of David, it says. And then he says in verse 4, God, David prays to God, this is a prayer. He says, show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. And teach me. We need to be teachable. Ready to learn. Ready to listen. With our eye, eyes open and our ears open. For you are the God of my salvation, he said. On you I wait all the day, patiently wait to hear God's instruction. Do we want to be taught? Verse 8 says, Good and upright is the Lord, Yahweh the Eternal. Therefore he teaches sinners in the way, in the right way to go, to live. The humble he guides in justice. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. And the humble, he teaches his way. God will teach the humble. But he will not teach the proud or the arrogant or those who are lifted up. And there are those today who are arrogant and proud and lifted up. And some of them used to be our brethren and some of them maybe were, but then they went astray. They went afoul. They went AWOL. They, they left the truth of God to go out to do their own thing. 
to go their own way and they claim it's the way of God. They claim that I am all wet, that I am just dripping with like a guy sprayed with a fire hose. It's just all wet and that I don't know what I'm talking about. And they claim the Passover Haggadah is pagan and an abomination. You know, and we went through the Haggadah, which I wrote myself based upon the Jewish Haggadahs, which a Haggadah is just a telling of the story. It's a Hebrew word. Don't be scared about a word. The word Haggadah, Haggadah means story. It's telling the story of the Passover. And the word Seder means setting forth. The setting forth of the emblems of the Passover. Like God commanded. But this one radical individual that left us years ago, and I put him out of the church, and now he's started up his own ridiculous church. I call it the disobedient church of God because he calls it the obedient church of God. Hmm. That's the name he chose, but I call it the disobedient, rebellious church of God, if it is even a church. It's, it's, it has no members, it's just uh, online. Well, it has some followers, on the internet. Some of them I think are in in the Philippines, Philippine Islands. But anyway, he says, and I read this scripture, you know, on the Passover, Haggadah evening, and maybe the first day of Passover, that in Exodus 12 there, we read where it says, they, and they, God told Moses them to eat the Passover fully clothed with their staff in their hands and shoes on their feet in haste. And so he says, Dankenbring sits down at a Passover Seder dinner table. They all sit down and eat the Passover. And it says you're supposed to stand up and eat it in haste. So I guess that's what, I guess that's what he's starting to do now this year after probably hearing my Bible study and then making up his own rebuttal. So he's going to stand up and eat like he's in a hurry, you know, and like he's going to have to flee somewhere tomorrow morning. Well, you know, the, the Jews all tell us, the rabbi, they say, well, you know, that was the first original Passover, and they had to stand up and eat it and in haste because they didn't know what moment they were going to have to get up and leave to flee, to escape. To escape from Egypt, to, to escape the iron furnace of Egypt. They had to be ready. They didn't know. God didn't tell them. So he said he, they were to eat it in haste and standing up. But ever since then, every Passover coming, we sit down to eat it at a table. We sit down and enjoy it as the festival of freedom, as a family and community thing not in haste standing up. And he says the four glasses of wine during the Passover, he says that's part of the Haggadah, Seder, that, he said that's unthinkable. By the time you finish that, you're going to be rolling around drunk. You know, what he said, well, we had the Seder, I've had, a lot of people have Seders, I've, Jewish people have had Passover Seders for 3,500 years, they never wind up rolling around drunk. When it says four cups of wine, just like we did this year at the Feast of the Passover, and we, we filled the wine cup with wine, and the so-called first cup is, is just the first time where you take a drink from the cup to begin the evening. You know, then you have another part of the cup later, then the th third one is the redemption. You just you drink the whole cup. You just drink some of the wine from the cup. And then the fourth cup, which is a cup of praise. The final cup. Praising God. They're not four whole cups. You don't just drink a glug, 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 you know, four times. That's not the way it goes. It never was. So this guy is being picky, picky, picky. And I'm just ashamed of him, but I'm really more concerned about his eternal welfare and his soul 
because God is going to cast every soul into hell, fire, Gehenna fire, that rebels against him and his law and sets them <clears throat> sets themselves up as some kind of a emissary or messenger claiming to be an end time apostle or whatever he might claim I don't even know I don't I surely don't even care but the fact that he's attacking us attacking me attacking the truth belittling the truth making fun of the truth besmirching the truth means that he is an evil smelling odor in the nostrils of God and God will deal with him so I don't worry about that the brethren I want us to know the fine points of God's law I want us to learn to appreciate God's law and as it says in Isaiah chapter 66 the attitude we ought to have like and what I just read here from David's words to be humble and teachable to look into the Word of God to study the Word of God to learn how to live pleasing in God's sight and in Isaiah 66 verse 1 it says thus says the Lord the eternal Yahweh heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool where is the house that you will build for me and where is the place of my rest for all these things has my hand made God has made the whole universe he created the earth and the stars and the Sun and the moon and the mountains and the valleys and the rivers and the wood from which our house is made and he says all my all the those things my hands have made and all those things exist says the Lord but on this person this person will I look do I have respect do I bother to look at with approval he says on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit poor of spirit humble and meek and contrite willing to be taught willing to listen God looks with approval and who trembles at my word not at the devil we don't need to tremble at him not at persecutors and and the uh, powers of political powers of this world or the religious powers of this world we don't need to tremble before them we need to tremble before the Word of God and fear him and keep his commandments as Solomon said Ecclesiastes 13 and verse 12 that's what we need to tremble at well one of these commandments of God is very little known and little regarded and little understood and it occurs during these days of unleavened bread it's a very special command that the world is overlooked and the churches poo poo and ignore if they even hear about it uh, and they t if you tell them what we do they may go laughing off into the sunset cackling like a bunch of jackrabbits or or woody woodpeckers I think is a probably ever see woody woodpecker cartoons mm -hmm. Well, hens cackle, but Woody Woodpecker has a mad, maniacal cackle when he goes, ha, 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 ha. Can't you just picture him running off laughing in Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies? <laughs> That's right. Well, they may act that way, but God is going to get the last laugh because nobody can laugh at God or his way and long endure. In Leviticus chapter 23, is a wonderful thing that starts during the days of unleavened bread on day two which is yesterday today is day three after the Passover and after the Seder and after the first day which is the holy day of Nisan 15 comes the day Nisan 16 and in Leviticus chapter 23 God says of this time 
verse 9, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. A sheaf basically means a handful. And it is of barley, the first crop that ripens in the spring in Israel. And he, the priest, shall wave the sheaf before the Lord at the, at the tabernacle or the temple to be accepted on your behalf as an offering so that God would then bless the harvest and the rest of the harvest. This is the first thing done to get the first fruits offered to God so he will bless the harvest. You shall do this on the day after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. Now, I'm going to explain this as we go along, but the Sabbath here is the holy day. Passover Sabbath, when we have the Seder and have the first holy day of Passover. That's a Sabbath day. It's the first annual Sabbath day. And after that Sabbath, is the 16th of Nisan, which was yesterday, and that's when the Jews at the temple offered the wave sheep offering to God by waving it before the Lord in the morning of the 16th day of Nisan. And then it says, verse 14, And you shall eat neither bread nor parched grain, or any flour or fresh grain, any kind of grain, until the same day that you brought an offering, the way sheep offering, to your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Well, then what? This is what the priests were to do at the temple forever. If there was a temple in Israel today, they'd be doing that. There is no temple, so, you know, then they can't do it until there's a temple revived. But they remember it, and they preach it in their synagogues, and they remember this command, and they're waiting for the day they can observe it again, when there is a temple and a functioning priesthood. But what else does it say here? Verse 15 says, and you, now the word you there, who, who's that referred to? Well, it means you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and me. Uh -huh. It means Israel. It means the people. All the people. Every one of the people. As God is saying this to Moses, representing the whole tribe of Israel, tribes of Israel. And he says, and you shall count for yourselves. So number one, we are to count, and two, he says, look, this is for you. This is for yourselves. I'm giving you this as a gift for you. Now we have to come to understand how it's for us and why it's for us and what we get out of it, to use the colloquial expression. There's something in it for us. There's a reason why God has given us this command to do. We have to figure that out. At, at using the clues and the hints and the information he gives us. But he says, you shall count for yourselves from the day after that Sabbath, that's a, that is the 16th of Nisan, from the day that you brought that sheep of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete or completed. Now the word Sabbath here also means week or weeks. <coughs> I've had go-rounds with this on this subject. This, the word here is Shabbat. Uh, uh, Shabbat, uh, Shabbatot in plural, because the word Sabbath is fe feminine in Hebrew and Shabbatot means the feminine form of the word Shabbat, which, which means rest. It literally means rest, cease from work, cease from toiling, cease from arduous labor, just cessation. You shall, you shall have seven cessations, There's seven completions, seven seizings, 
shall be completed. Doesn't necessarily mean the day we call Sabbath, but it also means week. As it says in Isaiah chapter 66 again. Isaiah 60, I think it's 66. We'll find maybe 65. <clears throat> and I mean, yeah, 65. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> Isaiah 65, Isaiah 66, I shouldn't say, it. there it is, Isaiah 66, the very end of the book of Isaiah, in verse 23, and it shall come pass, <laughs> it shall come to pass, from one new moon to another, and from one week to another, or one Sabbath to another, one week to another. The Jewish translation says week. The Moffat, I think, says week. Other translations say week. It can mean either week or Sabbath. All flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Now the Sabbath stands for the week. Why? Because it is the seventh day of the week, and every week has seven days. So at the end of every Sabbath means the end of every week. You can read this also, I think, the Rotherham translation of the book of Matthew, chapter 28, and a footnote. It shows plainly that in the Hebrew language and in the Greek idiom, the words Shabbat or Sabbath stands for week as well as meaning the day itself. It also stands for a Sabbath year. In Leviticus chapter 25, it speaks of the sabbatical years or the Sabbath years, the, 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 day, the years of rest, like the Sabbath is a day of rest, the sabbatical year is a year of rest. The key word that Shabbat means in Hebrew is rest or ceasing from work or something. It's resting. That's the key. So the meaning here in uh, Leviticus 23, you shall count seven weeks or seasons, restings, shall be completed. Count 50 days, verse 16, to the day after the seventh week. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. And that is the day of Pentecost. Pentecost in Hebrew is called Shavuot, the festival of Shavuot. Now the word Shavuot means literally in English weeks. And the word for week is Shavuah. The literal word for week is Shavuah and Shavuot is week. So this is the feast of Shavuot or the feast of weeks. Why do they call it the feast of weeks? because you count seven weeks to get there. Not, not seven Sabbath days, but seven weeks, and this is a feast of weeks, at the conclusion of seven weeks. Now that makes it pretty plain, but the final clincher on that and this evidence that this is talking about weeks is in Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse uh, six or seven. Well, actually, it's verse 9. Deuteronomy 16, verse 9. God says, you shall count seven weeks. Well, there it is, plain and simple, right out in front of us. Just, I could write that on a blackboard. I mean, it says it's seven weeks, clearly here. You know, we don't have to interpret Sabbath to get weeks. It just says weeks, showing the two are interchangeable. We already know that, but this proves it, nails it down with a with a with a great big uh, giant spike. So you shall count seven weeks for yourself. Again, it says for yourself. Begin to count the seven weeks from the day you begin to put the sickle to the grain. That is the day you do the wave sheep offering. Then you shall keep the feast of weeks not called the Feast of Sabbaths. 
It's the Feast of Weeks. To the Lord your God with a tribute of a free will offering. And the Feast of Weeks is the Feast of Shavuot, which is Pentecost. And that's how we count it from the day after Passover. Now, this is a very highly disputed thing today in the churches and even between the Jews. I mean, you might say 99% of the Jews follow the rabbis and they follow Moses and they do what what the Bible's the Torah says and they interpret that to mean the Feast of Weeks you count from the day after Passover the great high annual Sabbath but in history there's, all, there's that devil up there and he's always starting to stir up strife and create confusion and controversy. So he inspired someone among the ancient uh, Israelites, <coughs> among the priesthood, called Sadducees in the New Testament. And he inspired them to think that, well, we don't agree with that. We think that means the weekly Sabbath day that occurs in the days of unleavened bread that you should count from that weekly Sabbath day. Your, your seven literal Sabbaths or weeks and then you get to Pentecost. <coughs> well, you know, there's several problems with that which I'm going to show you in a minute. The first problem is okay, let's just say this is try it. All right, we're going to try that, and when the Passover occurs, maybe that's on a Wednesday, as it was this year, then we wait till the weekly Sabbath, which is today, then we start counting the Pentecost of the Omer tomorrow, Sunday. And if we follow that rule of thought, then every year, no matter when Passover occurs, maybe it occurs on a Monday night. Or Monday, so we wait till Sunday again to start counting the Omer. And if Passover occurs on a Sabbath, <laughs> then we don't even wait. We just start counting the Omer on Sunday, the day after the Passover. But what if the Passover occurs on Sunday? Well, then they'd make you wait until the next Sabbath would to be the last day of unleavened bread and then start the Omer count. So that really disassociates the starting of the Omer count from the Passover. It means it can start any time during the week, but it always starts on a Sunday. And that means after 50 days, you're always going to end up on a Sunday. I and mean, it just so happens that coincides 100% with Easter. They, they start the counting on Easter Sunday, which is tomorrow. That's when the church is going to start their counting, the Omer, and then they're going to wind up on the day that Catholics call Whit Sunday or Easter uh, Whit Sunday, which is their own Pentecost, 50 days later. So if you follow that way, you're following the Catholics. And your so-called wave sheaf offering is on Easter Sunday. And you're following Easter. And then 50 days to Whit Sunday, another Catholic feast. And I did an article years ago on Pentecost showing that Easter Sunday and the Pentecost is ancient. They're both, they're both pagan festivals. Easter's pagan in worship of the pagan sun goddess Ishtar. Astarte, <coughs> Astarte in the Hebrew, and uh, Whit Sunday is worship of the goddess Floralia, Flora or Floralia, which is mentioned in uh, the History of Civilization. I think it's called by by the uh, this big, big, long history book. I forget the Ariel and Durant. I think Will and Ariel Durant. Anyway, the Septuagint is the Old Testament, translated from the 
Hebrew and the Greek, 200, 250 years before Christ. The Septuagint was inspired because to be written and translated because Ptolemy Philadelphus of Egypt was hungering and thirsting for knowledge and he built the world's greatest repository of books in Alexandria, Egypt. And he wanted a copy of every famous book in the world and he definitely wanted a copy of the Torah of the Jews. About 250 BC. So the Jewish people he sent to them if they could have a copy of the Torah and if they could translate it into Greek from the, from the Hebrew. So the Jewish high priest and government sent 70 scholars to an island off the coast of Egypt to get together to translate the scriptures into Greek. And they called in the Torah, and they called it the Septuagint because that means the 70, the 70 scholars. There's about two from every tribe that went there and translated. And you can read the story in my article on the Septuagint and its origin. But they were definitely inspired and they did a wonderful job of translating and this was before there was such a thing as a Sadducee. This was before there was any controversy over the subject of when to offer the wave sheep offering. And in the Septuagint we read under Leviticus chapter 23 verse 15 Let's, let's just go back. Let me just double check something. Yeah, let's go back to verse 4 first. And it says, These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall call in their seasons. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, between the evenings, is the Lord's Passover. And then seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. In verse 7. And the first day shall be a holy convocation to you. You shall do no servile work. So the first day of unleavened bread is a holy convocation. Then skip down to verse 15. In the Septuagint. It says, And you shall number to yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day in which you shall offer the sheep of the heave offerings, seven full weeks, until the morning after the last week, you shall number fifty days, and you shall bring a new meat offering to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwellings loaves as a heave offering, two loaves. That's on Pentecost. Now, going back to verse uh, 9 in this chapter. Then the Lord said to Moses, say, spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and you shall say to them, When you enter into the land which I give you, and reap the harvest of it, then shall you bring in a sheaf, the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall lift up the sheep before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow of the first day, the priest shall lift it up. On the morrow of the first day. Well, the first day, as it says, is the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The morrow of the first day is the next day. So one is Nisan 15, the other one is Nisan 16. And that's the morrow of the first day, and that's the day we begin to count to do the wave sheep offering and begin to count to Pentecost, or to count the Omer. The Omer is the Hebrew name for the offering of the, of the sheep of barley. It's called an Omer. <clears throat> so that's very plain. It says from the, the day after the first day. 
Very plain. Well, all right. The Temple by Alfred Edersheim goes into this controversy a little bit. And he was, I said earlier, uh, a few days ago, and he, he was a Christian who grew up as a Jew in Judaism and knew all, the, learned all the Jewish rituals and symbols and the Torah and the Talmud and everything. And then he became a Christian. And his, after he became an adult, he converted to accepting Christ as the Messiah. Then he wrote this book called The Temple its ministry and services. And Edersheim, if I can get the right page here, here we go. In his book on the temple, on page 202, 203, he says, the, the sheep of first fruits. This is the barley offering after the, on the second day of Pentecost. And he, he talks about it here. And he says, The sheep of the first fruits, a little later on the evening of the same day. Well, let's go back to the previous page where he has a section called The Darkness. That same afternoon, after the first Passover day, so this is the end of the 15th now, Nisan. When the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land till the ninth hour. Well, <laughs> that's a different subject. Uh, and a little after the evening then, he says, of the same day, that is, he's talking about the 15th of Nisan, toward the evening, as it's growing dark, a throng followed from the Sanhedrin, of the Jews outside the city and came across the brook Kidron. They were coming there to take a sheaf of barley from the barley field. And then they would cut down the barley sheaf and take it back to the temple. And this is called the Passover sheaf or barley sheaf. And they would grind it down and then offer it before, parch it first, parch it and put it through a sieve until it was very fine flour. Then they'd uh, wave it before the Lord to be accepted of the, for all of Israel. So he would accept the whole harvest. Now we get to the part, the point of controversy here. Bottom of page 203, the morning after the Sabbath. He says, the expression, the morrow after the Sabbath, in Leviticus 23.12, or 23.11, has sometimes been misunderstood as applying that the, or implying that the presentation of the so-called first sheath was to be always made on the day following the weekly Sabbath of the Passover week. This view was adopted by the <clears throat> Sadducees and the house of the Bothusians, which was a high priest, in the time of Christ, they adopted that view. And later on, by Karite Jews and certain other interpreters. But this, he says, rests on a misinterpretation of the word Sabbath, as in analogous allusions to other feasts in the same chapter, Leviticus 23, it means not the weekly Sabbath, but the day of the festival, the annual Sabbath. The testimony of Josephus and of Jewish tradition leaves no room to doubt that in this instance we are to understand the Sabbath as the 15th of Nisan, the first holy day. On whatever day of the week it might fall, already on the 14th day of Nisan, the spot where the first sheep was to be reaped had been chosen and marked out by delegates from the Sanhedrin by tying together bundles in the field while standing. Then they'd go across the Kidron Valley to the field after the 15th of Nisan to reap the standing grain. <clears throat> 
on the evening of the 15th. Even if, even if it was a weekly Sabbath day, they'd go out to do it. Just as the sun went down, three men with a sickle and a basket, and the crowd but bystanders standing near would say, three times, has the sun gone down? Is the holy day over? And they would say, yes. And then they would say, with this sickle, with this sickle, with this sickle. And they'd say, yes. Into this basket, into this basket, into this basket. And they'd say, yes. On this Sabbath, even though it's a weekly Sabbath day, can they do this kind of work? On the Sabbath, yes. And lastly, shall I reap? Shall I reap? And having each time been answered in the affirmative, they cut down the barley to the amount of one ephah or ten omers or three seahs, which is equal to about three pecks and three pints of our English measure. The ears were brought into the court of the temple and thrashed out with canes or stalks so as not to injure the corn. And then it was parched on the a pan perforated with holes so that each grain might be touched by the fire and finally exposed to the wind. The corn thus prepared was ground in a barley mill which left the holes whole. According to some, the flour was always sifted successfully through 13 sieves, each one closer than the previous. The one ephah or ten omers of barley was cut down, only one omer of flour, or about 5.1 pints of our measure, was offered in the temple as the barley first fruits offering. That means a little over a quart. And that was on the second day of the Passover, or the 16th day of Nisan. The rest of the flour might be redeemed and used for any purpose. Well, Edersheim makes it clear. The Bible makes it... Is it going? The Bible makes it clear. The Septuagint makes it clear. Now let's read a commentary on the Old Testament by Kiel and Delich. Kiel and Delich also talk about this uh, subject in their commentary, volume 1, page 612. And it says, When the Israelites had come into the land to be given to them by the Lord, and had reaped the harvest, they were to bring a sheaf of first fruits of their harvest to the priest, that he might wave it before Yahweh on the day after the Sabbath, i.e., after the first day of matzot, or unleavened bread. According to Josephus and Philo, two ancient Jewish authorities, it was a sheaf of barley. because it was taken for granted in Canaan where, where, where the harvest began with the barley. The wheat ripens two or three weeks later. The priest was to wave the sheath before the Lord, that is, to present it symbolically by the ceremony of waving without burning any of it upon the altar. Now the the expression, he says, the morrow after the Sabbath signifies the next day after the first day of the feast of Matzah, Matzot. That is, or i.e., the 16th day of Abib, or Desan. Not the day of the Sabbath, which fell in the seven, seven days of, of, of Matzot. Not that day as the Bothusians supposed, still less the 22nd day of Nisan, or the day after the conclusion of the seven days of the feast. It 
uh, the next page, page 614, he says, This Sabbath does not mean the seventh day of the week, but the day of rest. Although the weekly Sabbath was always the seventh to last day of the week, but even the Day of Atonement is called a Shabbat, or Sabbath, and Shabbat Shabbaton, a Sabbath of Sabbaths. And it's not the weekly day, it's the Day of Atonement, which is a, an annual Sabbath. So the word Sabbath does apply to the first day of Passover, just like it applies to the first day of Sukkot, or Tabernacles, or Yom Kippur, or Yom Teru, or the Feast of Trumpets. They're all annual Sabbath days. Then he says this morrow after the Sabbath is really equivalent to the morrow after the Passover. And this is mentioned in Joshua chapter 5 verse 11. So let's go to Joshua chapter 5 and verse 11 and see if Joshua confirms what we've been reading. Book of Joshua, chapter 5, verse 10, it says, Then the Lord said to Joshua, This day I rolled away the reproach from Egypt from you, after they crossed the Jordan River, Dryshod. Therefore the name of this place is called Gilgal to this day, which means rolling. Verse 10, now the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at evening, between the evenings or twilight, at the afternoon of the 14th day of Nisan, on the plains of Jericho. And verse 11, And they ate of the produce of the land, the grain on the day after the Passover, the 16th day of Nisan, unleavened bread and parched grain on the very same day, the 16th of Nisan. Now what did they have to do before they could eat of the new grain, the parched grain of the field? What did they have to do? What did Leviticus 23 say? You offer the wave offering first, then you can eat of the harvest. So this shows that on the 16th day, day after the Passover, they waved the wave sheep and then they ate of the grain. That's the way it works. And on the next day it says, verse 12, then the manna seized. On the day after they'd eaten the produce of the land. And the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. So it goes by steps. They observed the Passover in the plains of Jericho on the 15th of Nisan. The next day they ate the grain of the land, the crops of the land. And the next day, the manna ceased. And Leviticus 23 says, You shall not eat of the grain of the land until you harvest the barley. With the, do the wave sheep offering first. Let's just go back and read that again so we can wrap our minds around it. Leviticus, Leviticus 23, verse 11. Verse 10, first of all. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land, which they had done under Joshua, which they give to you and reap its harvest, that they had the grain from the land there, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted of you on the day after. <coughs> The Passover holy day. The priest shall wave it. In verse 14 now, 
you shall eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until until the same day you have brought an offering to the Lord your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. So they had to bring the offering first. Then they could partake and eat of the grain. And Joshua 5, verse, verse 11 shows us that that's what they did under Jerich, under Joshua when they were camped in the fields of Jericho. So why, do, why am I spending all this time <coughs> on this precious diamond of truth, this precious jewel of truth? Because everybody's overlooked it, except the Jews. <laughs> you know, I, I find it incredible. The Jews have been doing this for 2,000 years, ever since the temple was destroyed, they still remember to count the Omer in their synagogues today, and they still count it from the day after Passover, 50 days, and the 50th day is Pentecost, or Shavuot. 50th day, actually, the word Pentecost means 50th day. That's the Greek name for the festival or the Feast of Weeks. <coughs> so back in the commentary of uh, Kiel and Delich, page 614, he goes on to say that this refers <coughs> the first day of the Feast of Matzot, or Unleavened Bread, is called Sabbath, irrespective of the day of the week and what, upon which it fell. The morrow after the Sabbath is equivalent to the morrow after the Passover, mentioned in Joshua 5, verse 11, where Passover signifies the day at the beginning of which the Passover meal was held, that is, the first day of unleavened bread, which commenced on the evening of the 14th. That is the end of the 14th. In other words, the 15th of Abed. I'm reading here. Mm -hmm. by, or, by offering the chief the first fruits of the harvest, the Israelites were to consecrate their daily bread to the Lord their God and practically to acknowledge that they owed the blessing of the harvest to the grace of God. They were not to eat any bread or roasted grains of the new crop until they had presented the offering of their God. This offering was fixed for the second day of the feast of the Passover, Nisan 16. That the connection between the harvest and the Passover might be kept in subordination to the leading idea of the Passover itself. The Passover is first and it is the key to all that follows just like the sacrifice of Christ was first without that we would have no Christian life no following no no reason to observe the days of unleavened bread they're putting out sin it all is contingent on the Passover and the sacrifice of Christ. So it all butts up to the Passover Holy Day. Not some arbitrary, just some general weekly Sabbath that's kind of disconnected, but just happens to be nearby. There's a great controversy over what weekly Sabbath doesn't mean. Even today, churches have got to argue over that. If the Passover is on, the, on a Saturday, for example, then should you start the barley harvest the very next day, counting the next day, or wait till the end of the next Sabbath day, which is the last day of the feast, and then start it on the Sunday after the feast? There are churches today who split hairs and argue over that. You know why they're wasting their time? Why they're, they're, they're 
just fooling around, wasting time because they're assuming that you count from the weekly Sabbath. And then they can't decide which weekly Sabbath to count from. The whole problem is solved if you just see what the Bible says, what the Jews say, and, and what the Josephus says, what, what the Septuagint says, and the evidence from the Bible itself is that you count from the second day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the day after the Passover. Solves everything. All the other problems are just whisked away, just disappear. But since they won't do that, they just keep arguing, keep on debating, and they can't make up their minds, or they all disagree, and they're in, they're in darkness. Satan the devil is the author of confusion. And he has the whole world confused. It's that old saying I remember, my mind's made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. <laughs> you ever hear that? I've heard people say that, I guess. I've heard that saying somewhere. I guess it was a joke originally. My mind's made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. Well, okay, that's enough from... Uh, Keel and Delich. I think we can set that aside. And now I want to ask the question, why does God say count the Omer? For 50 days, seven weeks, seven, each day of the week, that's seven times seven equals 49 days or seven weeks. Then the 50th day is Pentecost or Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. Why? <coughs> oh, why? <coughs> oh. Why? 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 Well, number one, brethren, it doesn't matter why. <laughs> God says do it, so we should do it. Are we in agreement? If God says do something, we should do it. <coughs> God is not a man that we should ignore him. When he, when he says count, we should count. Leviticus 23. <coughs> Leviticus 23 again. Verse 15 says, You shall count for yourselves. Well, so we're to do it for ourselves. There is a spiritual benefit if we do it. And if we don't do it, then there is a spiritual loss, a spiritual diminishment if we don't do it. Now, in Deuteronomy 16 and verse 9, again, he says, You shall count seven weeks for yourself until Pentecost. And then you shall keep the Feast of Weeks. Again, he says, you shall do it. It's a commandment. And he says, for yourself. It's not optional. If God says do it, I think we ought to do it. And I don't think there's any question about it or any doubt about it. But people can get careless unless they can understand a good reason to do it. Now in Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to read this quickly here. Christ said, verse 17, Don't think I came to destroy or do away with the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill, to observe, to guard, to keep, to fill up to the brim, to fill up to full measure, to interpret properly. He came to do the law, not to do away with the law, and to teach us how to do it. Then he said in verse 18, For assuredly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not a single jot or tittle of the law will pass away until all is fulfilled. Now, heaven and earth are obviously still here. We're still breathing air and standing on the earth and 
see the heavens during the daytime and the stars at night. They haven't passed away yet. So these commandments are still in effect. All of God's commandments. He didn't come to do away with any of the commandments of God. There were some temporary rituals, which he says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 10, that they're temporarily done away or suspended, like divers' washings and things, which we can't do now because there's no temple. So those things are temporarily suspended. Obviously, we can't worship at the temple. We can't do animal sacrifices or washings or purification ceremonies or a lot of things because there's no priesthood and no temple. But anyway, Christ did not come to do away with those things in God's law. He came to magnify them and to fulfill them. As it says in Isaiah chapter 42, in verse 21, he will make the law, magnify the law and make it glorious. Isaiah 42, 21. And now look at verse 19 here. And uh, Matthew 5, verse 19 says, Whosoever therefore breaks one of the littlest of these commandments of the Lord and teaches men so shall be called the littlest or the least in the kingdom. For I say unto you, that unless your righteousness is greater than that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means even enter into the kingdom of God. <coughs> well, the littlest commandment. Which commandment is that? <laughs> well, I don't know, but I, I want to keep them all. I don't want to take a chance that I'm going to miss one if I know a one. I don't want to be careless and stupid. I want to keep every commandment of God that I know about. So I learned about the Sabbath. I began to keep the Sabbath. I learned about the annual holy days. I began to observe the annual holy days. Then I learned that the church I was with was keeping certain days wrong. So I repented and I began to keep those days right. And then I learned about wearing the, the talit when I'm worshiping God and appearing before God, I put on the talit or the prayer shawl with the fringes. Because God says in Numbers chapter 15, this time we'll look it up. Verse 7, 38. Speak to the children of Israel and tell them to make tassels on their corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners. And so you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. And so you may not follow the harlotry to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined, humanly speaking. And that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy to your God. I am the Lord your God, he says, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. Well, that's where the problem came. You see, Israel really didn't want to worship God. They were human. Their human hearts were rebellious. As Paul says in Romans 8, verse 7, the carnal mind is enmity against God and is not subject to the law of God. The carnal human mind wants to go its own way. The carnal human mind wants to justify itself. So people become atheists because they don't want to have a God over them. The true God, the living God, the creator, they don't want him to tell them how to live their lives. They don't want him meddling in, quote, their business, unquote. 
they don't want him them him telling them how to live and what to do and what not to do. They don't want to hear that commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, because they want to commit adultery. They don't want to hear God's commandment, you shall not steal. They're stealing all the time. Look at all the crime around us today and theft by corporations and big businesses and everybody on every level today is a thief. But God's word, Christ came and said, I did not come to do away with the law and the law of God is to be observed minutely and particularly. He wants us to also count the omer. He says, you shall count it for yourself every year from Passover to Pentecost. You know, that's how we determine the date of Pentecost. People don't understand this either. But if you start counting the omer from the day after Passover, 50 days, going by the calendar that God instituted, the month of Nisan, Abib, the first month in the calendar, can have 29 or 30 days. The beginning of the next month begins with the new moon sighting. That new moon may be sighted the end of 29 days or it may take to the end of 30 days. But a month in the Hebrew depends upon the moon going around the earth in one complete cycle. And that occurs in 29 and a half days. So that means sometimes you can see the new moon after 29 days and sometimes it's after 30 days. So knowing that Abib can have 29 or 30 days, then the second month, Er, can also have 29 or 30 days. Then you come to Sivan. Now in a normal year, where maybe uh, Nisan has 30 days and Er has 29, then Pentecost will come up on Sivan 6. But if we happen to have two months in a row with 30 days, then there's an extra day you have to account for. So Sivan comes up on Sivan 5. But if Nisan and Abib, both, uh, Nisan and Er, both only have 29 days, then you got two days left over. Or a long, a one day extra. So then Pentecost is on C van 7. So according to the, that, means Pentecost can occur on C van 5, 6, or 7. The churches today don't even know that. And they say, well, C van 6, you go by the Jewish calendar. They go by the Jewish or uh, fixed mathematical construct calendar started by Hillel II in 358 AD. And on that calendar, the months are stabilized. So that Pentecost is always on C. Van 6. <coughs> but that's because his calendar averages the months and creates a, a calendar which is based on monthly averages and the 19 year time cycle. But in the original calendar that they had in the days of Christ and the apostles, back to the days of Moses, they cited the new moons and then they determined the beginning of the month accordingly. And so uh, Pentecost could occur on C. Van 5, 6, or 7. Now why then do we do this? Number one answer, God said so. <laughs> Number two answer, it's for ourselves. It's a matter of discipline. We're to be counting it. Now counting means day by day. There's 49 days, seven days, seven weeks equals 49. We need to be counting. We ought to be counting every day, faithfully, even marking it on a calendar so we don't forget. Now that may seem like a useless mathematical exercise to some people. But it isn't. There is more to it than that. 
we need to learn God has a reason for every commandment. Now this story of the Omer parallels, <coughs> parallels the journey of Israel out of Egypt and the 50th day of the Omer count turns out to be Pentecost or Shavuot and that turns out to be the day God came down to the top of Mount Sinai and gave the Ten Commandments. That was on Sivan 6, the day of Pentecost or Shavuot, the day of first fruits. So, <coughs> the counting of the Omer depicts day by day the journey of Israel from Ramses in Egypt to Mount Mount Sinai, Jebel Laws in the Arabic, which is on the Arabic Peninsula, now owned by Saudi Arabia. Fifty days occurred when they reached the mountain, and God gave the Ten Commandments and spoke to all Israel. Forty-nine days they had been counting the Omer, and then that great event occurred on day 50. Day 50 was the day of revelation. They had to endure. They had to go through that process. They had to stay on that journey day by day. They, they were being taught by Moses to look forward to the end of the journey, to look forward to the 50th day. They were waiting in great anticipation for something to occur on day 50, and they got it. God came down and spoke with an entire nation. They all heard the voice of God thundering from heaven amidst earthquakes and thunder and lightning and rumbling and fire like a furnace on top of the mountain. And they heard the voice of God. They heard the Ten Commandments. In the book The Essence of the Holy Days by Abraham Yaakov Finkel, Chapter 9 is about the Omer. And he says on the second night of Passover we begin counting the Omer. It's called Sephirat HaOmer. We count 49 days and then till the first day of Shavuot, which is celebrated on the 50th day. The Torah says you are to count seven complete weeks after the day following the Passover holiday. The Omer is a measure of new barley offered in the temple on the second day of Passover as a token of gratitude for the ripening fruit of the harvest. We count the Omer every night as the stars appear, or at least every day. We count the Omer daily for 49 days. Now, because this parallels the coming of the Israelites out of Egypt and until they reach the time they're prepared and ready to meet with God so God won't just wipe them out or obliterate them because of their sins. As they progress on this journey they are leaving Egypt and its idolatry and its pollution and corruption further and further behind. They are distancing themselves from Egypt and drawing near to God. Nearer and nearer to God until on the 49th day they had completed a journey of seven times seven days, which pictures perfection times perfection, or completion times completion. They've made the journey. Now they're ready to appear before God. You can read the story in Exodus chapter 19. So on page 162 he says, For deeper understanding, now this is what I think we all need, and this is very important, for deeper understanding of why we do this, 
or should do it. For deeper understanding for the counting of the Omer, we must realize that the world is endowed with 50 levels of wisdom. Moses, the greatest man that ever lived, in their opinion, until Christ came, I would say, attained 49 of those levels. The ultimate wisdom can, is contained on the 50th level, or the 50th day, or when God reveals himself. That was beyond his reach. The 49 levels of wisdom are represented by the 49 days of counting the Omer, going from one, <coughs> one step to the next step. Just like you grow in knowledge, you go through college, you go through first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, ninth grade, twelfth grade in college. You go through all these levels, those steps of increased knowledge and learning and preparation for what? For life. For eternal life. And the 50th day Shavuot is the day of the giving of the Torah. The day God made his covenant with Israel parallels the 50th gate of wisdom. 50 is a jubilee number. It's the number of the great jubilee in God's plan. So 50 is the highest level. It's the year of release, the year of redemption, the year of liberty proclaimed throughout the land. So this picture is complete liberty coming into oneness with God that we have to trek and travel and journey to get to the point where we're ready to meet God. Just like in our lives today, we are on a trek. We are journeying, overcoming sin, rooting sin out, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, striving to prepare ourselves to be ready to meet Christ at His coming. He's washing us with the water of His Word to get rid of blemishes and, and uh, wrinkles and all those spots and blemishes so that we can be clean and pure in his sight when he comes. As a counterpart to the 50 levels of wisdom, he says, there are 50 levels of spiritual contamination because God created the world in perfect balance, making one opposite the other. That principle is relayed in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 14. For the good and the evil inclination, the forces of holiness opposite the forces of impurity. <coughs> we all desire to do good, to be better. That we all have human nature, which wants to pull us down and is an agent of destruction. And we have to overcome the pulls of the flesh and the pride of the mind and the pride of life and the, the temptations of the world. As John says, we have to overcome those things to enter the kingdom of God through his spirit and the power of his Holy Spirit. So this is a... <coughs> the Israelites in Egypt was a picture it was a picture of our being in spiritual Babylon or spiritual Egypt before we were baptized. When we were baptized, we, it was like Israel coming through the Red Sea. And we received the Holy Spirit, and now we're on a journey to the kingdom of God, even as they were on a journey to Mount Sinai to meet with God and become his kingdom, his people, by a covenant. And we have entered into a covenant with God. So when Christ returns, <coughs> when Christ returns, we will be in his kingdom as his spiritual bride and shining gloriously like the stars of heaven forever. So we are on a trek. We are on a pathway. Just like they were in typology. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that those things are an example for us. And everything they went through was an example 
for us. The temptation in the wilderness, the lack of water, the lack of food, the trials and the tests they went through were examples of our trials and our tests and the things we put up with daily in the world, sometimes with our family and our friends and former associates and those who condemn and complain and criticize. We have to learn to be righteous and godly and holy following in the footsteps of Christ. We have to go on our journey overcoming temptation and every pull of the flesh and of sin. So as he says here, in Egypt the people degenerated and declining in their morality under their slavery until they reached the 49th level of contamination. About all they had left for them was they still had the Hebrew language. But they were slaves. They had been Egyptianized. They had been polluted and perverted. God had to clean up their minds and their hearts and bring them out of Egypt forcibly. He had to release them by the ten plagues on the Egyptians. Then he had to keep encouraging them, even through the waters of the Red Sea. And even after that great miracle, they still had to contend with their human nature. And they, they, they start to complain and provoke God. And he had to deal patiently with them, as with children. And they finally, though, after 50 days, they reached the level of being close enough to God where he gave them the Ten Commandments. They had to fast and they had to wash their clothes and not come near their wives for three days and prepare themselves. Then they saw the greatest miracle of all time. They saw God come down to the top of Mount Sinai and they heard his voice to every one of them giving the Ten Commandments. Well, the counting of the Yomer, there's a lot more to it than that, but this is just the introduction. How do we make use of that Omer count? There are seven characteristics that God has revealed of himself to man as the Jewish people have determined by their study. There's seven shepherds in the Bible called the shepherds of Israel. They are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and Aaron, and Joseph, and David. And each one of them portrays a particular quality of God. Like Abraham stands for loving kindness and love. Isaac stands for Gevura or strength containing discipline. And Jacob stands for beauty, humility, gentleness, and peace. <coughs> Moses stands for the quality of netzach, which means overcoming, prevailing, enduring, like the enduring Torah for eternity. Aaron stands for the principle of glory, splendor, the glory of the priesthood, splendor, and humility. Joseph stands for the picture of the foundation, humility, faith, in God, exemplified by Joseph. And David stood for the principle of kingship, rulership, learning how to rule and be an example to others, how to govern. <coughs> and those are the three, the, the seven shepherds and the seven major traits that God wants us to build into our character and inculcate into our being. And they're also reflected in the fruits of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23, God says the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, endurance, gentleness, goodness, kindness, <coughs> kindness and faith. They're parallel. They interreact. And the, we are to count the Omer and concentrate on overcoming. This is a period to focus on overcoming and working on ourselves from now until Pentecost. It's like a little 
summary, a little, a little uh, linkage from Passover to Pentecost, a roadway, a roadmap to build godly, righteous, holy character. So I urge you to write for our article on meditations on the Omer and Sefirat HaOmer so we can use this tool to help us overcome weakness and instability so we can be strong in faith and in the power of God's Spirit to serve Him to the end of the age without fail. Thank God for the lessons in the hidden message of the Omer Count. Praise God for His mercy and His revelation. Amen. Amen.